Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Science on Tap. I'm Christina Juarez. I'm the museum educator at the Wagner Free Institute of Science, and I will be your host for tonight's program. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge that the land on which the Wagner sits and Philadelphia itself are both part of Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homelands of the Lenape peoples. The Lenape were forced from their lands by colonial expansion and are now dispersed across North America. We aim to deepen the understanding of the history of Philadelphia and the land that we occupy and create a more equitable space for all. If this is your first time joining us, Science on Tap is a free monthly gathering held on the second Monday of each month that features presentations by scientists or other experts followed by a lively conversation. Science on Tap is sponsored by a consortium of six Philadelphia institutions, the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University, the American Philosophical Society, the Mütter Museum of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, the Penn Museum, the Science History Institute, and the Wagner Free Institute of Science. If you love us, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram and join our email list, which you can do on our website, scienceontapphilly.com. Um, and that's about it for messages from me. So welcome Dr. Catherine Milkel and everybody enjoy. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's really nice to be here. Uh, years and years ago, I was a graduate student working um, at St. Joe's and then also at the Wagner. So it's nice to be invited back to give a talk uh, representing the Wagner. So today I would like to talk to you about some of my favorite fishes. And we are going to be looking specifically at actinopterygiums. So actinopterygians are referred to as ray-finned fishes, and there are 27,000 valid species of actinopterygian fishes on the planet today. This means that more than half of the vertebrates on the planet are actinopterygian fishes. And these fishes get their name because of their fin structure. So if you look at this fish right here, their fins are basically webs of skin that are then supported by these internal fin rays or almost like hard spikes. So that's how they get their name of ray-finned fishes. If you think of a bony fish, chances are you are thinking about an actinopterygian. Uh, these are very familiar fishes. They're fishes you're going to see in an aquarium they are fishes you're going to have potentially as pets. Um, if you fish, most of the time you're probably catching actinopterygians, and then those are commonly the fish that you'll eat. So all of the fishes that you see here are actinopterygians. Um, they're either my pets or fishes I've taken pictures of at aquariums. And if you look at these fish, I've just chosen a random assortment and you can see that their body shapes and their morphologies are drastically different. So this is um, because their evolutionary story is a 420 million year old story where you have these bursts of diversification or extinctions. And this story has led to all of these diverse morphologies that you see here. It has also led to these fishes being found basically anywhere from the deep sea to small streams and everything in between. The thing is the early evolution of this highly successful group is really poorly understood. And part of that is because the majority of the fishes that we see today are teleosts. And teleosts, everything that you're looking at here would be an example of a teleostean fish. And when we are looking at trying to figure out the early evolution of this group, we really need to be looking at non-teleostean fishes. And these are usually referred to as lower actinopterygians. So the problem is there's not many lower actinopterygians alive today. So the majority of that 27,000 living species would be teleosts. 
And you need to be looking at lower actinopterygians to understand kind of the evolution of the fish we see today. There are a few lower actinopterygians that are alive today. Um, they're just not as diverse. So there's three main groupings of non-teleostean lower actinopterygians that are alive today. And these may be a little bit more unfamiliar to you because there are not that many genera, there are not that many species. The three groupings of living lower actinopterygians are going to include the cladistia, chondrosteae, and the holosteae. And so if we look, the cladistia would really be represented by this little guy here called a biker, or sometimes you may have heard it referred to as polypterus. Uh, the chondrosteae, there would be petalfish with this really enormous snout, which gives it its name. And then the other example of a chondrostean would be sturgeon. And if you like caviar, Caviar comes from sturgeons. And then the holosteae would include gar, that if you watch any of the Discovery Channel, like those river monster shows, the alligator gar would be a really good example of a holostean. The other example of a living holostean would be um, the bowfin. And if you took any anatomy courses, especially like a comparative anatomy course in school, you probably had a fish skull of a bowfin called uh, Amia from the genus Amia. So lower actinopterygians are important for our understanding of our fishes alive today, but we don't have many living representatives of lower actinopterygians. There is though a much larger diversity that is preserved in the fossil record. And for any investigation into the evolution of actinopterygians, we really need to be looking at these fossilized forms. But it's kind of this weird paradox. These are important fishes, but fossil lower actinopterygians have the distinction of being among the least studied of all fossil vertebrates. And I can attest to this. When paleoichthyologists have conferences, we all fit into one room. And that would be including everyone working on lower actinopterygians and then other fishes that would not be considered lower actinopterygians. So it's a small community of people who are working on these fish. Um, and I have decided to concentrate on one subset of these fossil lower actinopterygians, fishes referred to as paleonescoids. Honestly, it's kind of a nice thing to be a scientist working on these understudied groups because um, I have no reason to get bored. There's a lot of work to do. There are a lot of specimens to study and there are a lot of questions to be asked. So there's a lot to do and I will be able to easily find things to work on for my career. So that's the positive note about lower actinopterygians. So what are paleonescoids? Um, paleonescoids is a term that's used to refer kind of informally to this grouping of fishes that would have been alive during the Silurian period all the way to the Cretaceous period. And so if we look at this slide, we have a geological time scale. And so we have in this column eras and then periods. And then all the way to the right, this is a time scale in millions of years. So the further down you are on this geological time scale, the older a time period we're dealing with. And so I have these two red stars. Those two red stars are showing you kind of the range that paleonescoids would be, have been on the planet. So they range from the Silurian and not exactly at the start of the Silurian. So let's say 420 million years and they made it into the Cretaceous and probably about 120 million years ago. To kind of put things in perspective on this geological time scale, here we are right here with the little Google map uh, pointer. 
And then here would be when dinosaurs were first on the planet. So these paleoniscoids, they are older than dinosaurs and the dinosaurs didn't make it out of the Cretaceous. So they actually were on the planet longer than dinosaurs. Um, but even though the range of the, the paleoniscoids would be from the Silurian to the Cretaceous, they really dominated the Paleozoic seas. So here we have the Paleozoic era. This is really prime time for the paleoniscoids. So they um, are very popular in the uh, Paleozoic. And then they are especially diverse during the Carboniferous. So where you have that red box is showing you the Carboniferous. So these fishes were incredibly diverse in this time period, about 359 to 299 million years ago. I've decided to concentrate specifically on Carboniferous paleoniscoids, um, and I've done so because this is a time of incredible diversity for these fishes. And they are diverse in terms of the number of taxa. There are many different species during the Carboniferous, and the Carboniferous was really a time where there was a massive explosion or radiation in the number of different species on the planet. This also was a time, though, that you have this massive radiation in terms of their morphology. So if you look at all of these fishes on the screen here, all of these are examples of Carboniferous paleoniscoids, and you can see we range from kind of your regular fish-shaped fish up here to we have deep-bodied or disc-shaped fish here. You have elongated, almost eel-like fishes, and then basically everything in between. So the Carboniferous is this incredible time of diversity in terms of the number of different taxa and their morphologies. So there are a few things that kind of are unique and kind of characteristic of your paleoniscoids. Um, I know I just said that they had diverse body shapes, but by far the kind of majority of your paleoniscoids are going to have a fusiform or a fish-shaped body. And here is kind of a general paleoniscoid to kind of give you an example. It looks like a fish. So it has a fusiform body, and then paleoniscoids are going to be characterized by having a single dorsal fin and then a single anal fin. And they have a special type of caudal fin or tail fin that's referred to as being a heterocircle caudal fin. And what that means is their bony vertebral column actually extends up the dorsal lobe of the caudal fin. So where you have that little blue dashed line would represent where the vertebral column would extend up into that dorsal lobe. And that's very characteristic of your lower actinopterygians. Other features, paleoniscoids do kind of share some characteristic bones of the skull. I'm just going to point out a few of them. Um, the first kind of characteristic bone of the skull would the, be this bone in green that I'm putting the P on. This is the preoperculum. And the preoperculum in paleoniscoids would be kind of hatchet shaped, where you have this kind of broad um, expanse and then this kind of narrow limb or arm. And the preoperculum would be in front of your operculum that you have right here. And it would be closely associated with the big bone of the upper jaw, your maxilla, that we have here in blue. And the maxilla in paleoniscoids is going to have this really large expanded region behind the orbit or the eye. Other characteristics that kind of define your paleoniscoids would be dealing with their scales. 
So their scales are going to be rhombic in shape or kind of square to rectangular. The shape can kind of change depending on where the scale came from the body. So they have rhombic scales and they have a really unique histological makeup. And uh, what is characteristic of your lower actinopterygians is there's going to be this outer layer on the scales. It's also found on the bones of the skull called ganoin. And ganoin would be similar to the enamel of our teeth, but totally different. That would be like the closest thing to compare it to. And what's neat about the ganoin is it's laid down in subsequent waves so that you end up having this really intricate ornamentation of ridges on scales and the bones of the skull. Sometimes it will be kind of little tuberculations, so it looks kind of stippled. And on the scales, you can have the ganoin ridges kind of forming these pectinations or serrated margins on the scales. The other thing about the scales is they're characterized by peg and socket articulation. So all of the scales are going to have this really large peg and that peg would be situated in a socket that we can see here on the, we're looking kind of at the underside or the inner surface of a scale here. So the peg of a lower placed scale would be situated and articulated in this socket of a scale above. So between this peg and socket articulation and this thick layer of ganoin, you would have basically all of your fishes in this little suit of armor created by these scales. So these fishes are important and they have traditionally always been considered important. They're considered important because it has been long noted that the body plan of today's fishes is probably derived from an ancestor within the paleoniscorps. So everyone agrees that these fishes are crucial to the understanding of the early evolution of today's fishes. The bad side of that is, even though everyone says these fish are important, we really need to have a better understanding of these fossil fishes before we can be asking good questions about the evolution of lower actinopterygians and then the fishes today. So where are we with our current understanding of these fishes? There's a lot of room for improvement. Um, if we look at the literature, what we can see is we don't really have a strong grasp on the taxonomic diversity of these fishes. There are many specimens in museum collections that need to be studied. It needs to be determined if they represent new taxa. And if they do, they need to be described. There's also a lot of already described taxa that need to be redescribed. Um, there was a huge amount of descriptive work done in the 1800s or the early 1900s. And, you know, we're so far out from those original descriptions with different ideas, different um, knowledge that we need to go back and look and redescribe those fishes. Um, so then if we don't have a good idea about the taxonomic diversity, it's not surprising that we don't really have a firm grasp on the morphology that these fishes present. Again, if you look at the literature, you will see that there are a lot of morphological features that have either been misinterpreted or surprisingly interpreted differently by different researchers. And I teach human anatomy when I'm not working on fish. And my students would be so upset if this was the case for humans. But for lower actinopterygians, there's no standardization in how bones are identified and named. So different researchers will look at the same exact bone and they will give it a different name than someone else. So you have different researchers referring to the same bones by very different names. And this is leading to, we're actually missing our ability to understand morphological diversity because we're not diving deep into 
some of these morphological features. Because of these problems, it shouldn't be surprising that we don't have strong hypotheses of evolutionary relationships for these fishes. There's no consensus on how these paleoniscoids are related to each other, how they're related to other lower actinopterygians, and then how they're related to today's actinopterygians. And really, this comes down to when you're trying to put together hypotheses of evolutionary relationships, you need to understand the taxa you're trying to explain, and you need to understand their morphology. Missing that firm understanding about the taxonomic diversity and the morphology, and then trying to use those as data to build hypotheses about evolutionary relationships is basically trying to put a puzzle together with lots of missing pieces. We can't expect to have a better understanding about the evolutionary relationships of these fish until we collect all of the puzzle pieces. And so understanding the taxonomic and the morphological diversity of these fishes is important in the field referred to as phylogenetic systematics. This is a field in biology that is attempting to reconstruct evolutionary histories and study patterns of relationships amongst different organisms. And this is done through building of phylogenies. And phylogenies would be um, best described as being like evolutionary trees. And they are hypotheses of relationships amongst taxa. When you are dealing with fossil taxa, the data you need to do phylogenetic analyses to build these evolutionary trees of relationship would be the fish you include, so the taxa, and then morphological features. And these are referred to as characters. And when you do a phylogenetic analysis, you are analyzing large numbers of organisms and looking for patterns in shared morphological features, because the idea is if you have organisms with many of these shared morphological features, they've probably inherited it from a common ancestor. And you use that information to build these evolutionary trees of relationship. Now, all of these phylogenies are hypotheses, and these hypotheses are only going to be as strong as the data you use to construct the phylogenies. I, as a student, was always told garbage in, garbage out. If you have data that is not strong, you will put it into the computer program to run the phylogenetic analysis. It's a statistical analysis. The computer is going to give you something, but it's always something that you have to think about that these hypotheses are only as strong as the data you use to construct them. And if we are saying we don't have a strong grasp on the taxonomic diversity, the taxa that we include in these analyses, and we don't have a strong understanding of the morphological features that we use to construct these trees, it's not surprising that we don't have strong hypotheses of relationship. So how can we actually improve our understanding so that we have good data to be able to feel confident in building trees of relationships? We have to go back to the fundamentals. We need to go back and look at those missing puzzle pieces and work on building up those pieces so that we can build up uh, good data to analyze. So the first missing puzzle piece is the taxa. And this is where descriptive work is going to be incredibly important. And a lot of my research has focused on descriptive work. Descriptive work is going to start with a lot of formal in-depth study of specimens. Um, this is where museums are incredibly important. Museums are going to house these specimens, make them available for researchers to come in and study them in the collection. Uh, I am very lucky that you can also arrange for loans of material so that I can take them back to my lab 
and work on them because some of this work takes a long period of time. So there has to be a formal study of specimens, looking at these specimens, looking at their morphology, and then comparing it to what is already described. If it looks like the specimens that you're working on are representing a new novel taxon, then you start writing morphological descriptions. And these are pretty detailed, written out descriptions, bone by bone, um, scale by scale of the fishes. This is supplemented with photographs and then scientific illustrations of the fishes. And if it looks like this is a new taxon, you do have to designate something called a holotype. And a holotype is best kind of thought of as being a reference specimen. It is what you are basing your description on so that in a hundred years, a scientist can go and look at that same exact specimen and have an idea of what it was you were looking at when you were writing your description. You then have to name your new taxon. And then in order for this new taxon to be considered valid, you need to publish a description, the name, and a designation of a holotype. So if we look at what kind of this descriptive work is, you start with looking at the bones. And basically you have to write out a written description of everything. So I start with the snout and I work my way back. And for each bone, you do this very detailed description of what bone is present, what's its shape, are there any projections or depressions? What does the Ganoin ornamentation, the ridges or the tuberculation that's on your bones, um, what does it look like? You describe what that bone is articulating with, what it is abutting against, and then anything special about that bone, like is there a canal line, a pore, um, or sometimes, is there's a difference in the number of bones between the left-hand side of the body or the right. And you do this, writing this out bone by bone so that someone who's reading this can kind of picture what it is that you're seeing. You then move on to describe the scales and it's the same thing. You need to describe any type of morphological features and these could change depending on where they're found on the body. So you break the body down into regions and you describe what these scales look like, anything special about them, and then you can do some specific counts. And so the counts are going to be that these scales are going to be arranged in these pretty predictable rows that you can see these kind of vertical rows of scales. You can count the number of scale rows so that you know the number of scale rows along the length of the body or you can count them to the origins of fins. And this is important because if you have multiple specimens, the number of scale rows won't change, even if you have a small specimen or a large specimen. So it shouldn't change within the same taxon. You then move on to fins, and you have to describe the placement of the fins, the shape, and then um, pretty tedious, but you count all of the individual fin rays and describe if they have any special features like bifurcations. All of this written description is then backed up with photographs and illustrations. And to me, this is one of the most important things in a description. And I like to take up as much space as I am allowed with pictures and then the illustrations. If I see a new paper published, the first thing that I go to would be the pictures and the illustrations. The illustrations are important because it does give some interpretation that if there's a bone broken, I may recognize it as being a broken bone and then I can kind of figure it as one someone else might interpret it as being uh, two bones. So it's good to give both a photograph and an illustration so that people can kind of look at how you interpreted things and compare it back to the specimen. And then the last thing in a description is you do compare it to already described taxa. How are they different? How are they the same? 
Then we do have um, another part when you are getting ready to publish, you have that description that's really detailed, pretty long, a little bit tedious. And if you think that you have a new genus or a new species within a genus, you need to write a diagnosis. And you can kind of think of this as being just the facts. It's going to be the shorter description of the characteristics found in this fish that makes it separate and distinct from all of the other described fishes. And this is usually given in this like telegraph style. It's not in complete sentences. So you would give a diagnosis and the diagnosis should reflect what you were seeing in that holotype, that specimen that you have designated as being a reference specimen that that diagnosis and the description is kind of tied to. The next part would be to name your new genus or species. And I find this to be very difficult. And in order for your new taxon to be valid, it needs to be published. Best way to do this would be to publish it in a peer reviewed journal or a book where you would have other scientists review it before it's published to look for any problems. And then after your description is published, it is considered a valid new taxon. So I also want to note that redescriptions when you're talking about paleoniscoids are also important. And this is because many paleoniscoids were described in the 1800s or the early 1900s. And some of those descriptions are not as detailed as what we do today. There may not be photographs. There may not be very clear illustrations. Here are three examples of illustrations from uh, Agassiz in the early 1800s, where it's a little bit difficult to see what is present on these fishes and how the bones have been identified. There's also been just so much time that has passed since these were described that it's always good to reinvestigate with new eyes these fishes that have already been described. And lastly, there was a tendency in the 1800s that every fish that was described was kind of lumped into one of the few genera that were already described. And so we have some genera that are considered wastebasket genera, where they might have 50 species in it. And most likely, if you were to look at that genus, you would see that there's a lot of hidden diversity within that genus and that some of them don't actually belong in the genus they were placed in. The other thing that we can do to hopefully improve our understanding of these fishes is to start doing kind of deeper investigations into morphological features. And this should hopefully help us with missing puzzle piece two. And so it is good to kind of choose a bone or a couple of bones and do these in-depth investigations into specific bones and look at them across numerous taxa. This helps when you are focusing in on specific bones to kind of capture some of that morphological diversity, describe it, look for patterns or trends across a variety of different um, fishes, and then this can help you to recognize new morphological features that should be placed in the phylogenetic analyses. The other thing that I have tried to do is work on proposing some standardization on how bones are identified, or at least make it really clear how I am identifying bones so that there is a written record of that. So where are we with our understanding of paleoniscoids and how they are related to today's fishes? This is a work in progress. So we have a lot of missing puzzle pieces. We need to be able to understand the players or the taxa a little bit better. And this can be done through taxonomic descriptions and redescriptions of already described species. We also need to be looking at tackling missing puzzle piece number two 
and doing these closer investigations on these morphological features or characters. And this can be done through these in-depth studies and discussion about morphological features. I have tried to, and I will continue to describe new species so that we have a better understanding of taxa. I have also worked on looking at some of the bones. I started with the snout and I'm kind of working my way back on the skull. And it's all with this hope that these two pieces, the taxa and the morphological features, this is the raw data we need in order to do phylogenetic analyses and produce strong hypotheses of relationship. And so this is something that it is good to go back to these fundamentals and be working on because it's going to allow us to be asking bigger questions, hopefully in the near future. And this is something that multiple researchers are working on to fill in all of these missing pieces. So it is really exciting every single time that there's a new taxon uh, described. It's really exciting every single time someone publishes a paper looking at specific morphological features. And then it's really exciting when people publish updated phylogenetic analyses and those results. So that's what I have for you tonight. I want to thank you for your attention, and I would be glad to answer any questions if there's questions. Catherine, thank you so much for that talk. I have a couple of questions already posted in the chat, so I'm going to read one of those out, but uh, anyone else can feel free to add questions to the chat. We have about 20 minutes. So the first question is, in view of all the uncertainties, how can we be sure that two similar fossils are or are not the same species? So that's where it is really good to publish and to document. So those descriptions are good at documenting what you were seeing in what you think may be a new species. And that's where the comparison is going to be really important as well. Peer review before you can publish, it is um, important to have other experts in the field kind of review it ahead of time. And if they see something that they think is missed, they will comment for you to go back and look at. But the really good way of testing all of this is through the phylogenetic analysis, that if you put the data in, and you see that there's no distinction between what you're calling a new taxon and then something that was already described, that would be evidence that you need to go back to the drawing board with what your conclusion was in an earlier paper. And we have a question from Dennis who says, is there a promising effort to create a uniform nomenclature for morphology? I, um, even though I have published and I have spent a lot of time thinking about this, I don't know. Um, there seems to be different schools of thought on how things are named, and some of it goes back to tradition, and that earlier you would use a certain set of information, and that's how it's always been done, and sometimes it's hard to step away from tradition. Uh, I think what is important and what I'm seeing more now is people making it very clear in the papers that they publish what nomenclature they're using and why. And that can be really helpful so that if you are picking up a paper, um, for instance, there's some bones, the first bone in the skull roof, some people refer to that as a frontal. Other people refer to it as a parietal. The problem is the second bone in the skull roof, some people refer to that as a post parietal, other people refer to that as a parietal. So if you're using the term parietal for two very different bones, it can be tricky really quickly. So that's why I think a good positive thing that I've been seeing lately is people making it very clear before you get to the description they put in a section on their paper about nomenclature and how they are naming bones and why. So at least there's that kind of like disclaimer to help you when you start reading the description. 
I wish there was a um, standardized nomenclature. I might be wrong in my nomenclature, and I'm totally fine with saying with saying if someone tells me that I'm wrong and there's evidence, I will change it. That's progress of science is that you reassess and you make changes based on the data at hand. And our next question is, what is your favorite aspect of studying these fish and why? So I like it because it is this really big puzzle. Um, everything is kind of open. Um, you are going sometimes to museums. I've been to a museum where I was looking at specimens that were taken out for maybe the first time from their original shipping containers to the museum. And those fishes were collected over 100 years beforehand. So it's pretty neat to think about these are fishes from maybe 300 million years ago that were taken out of the earth and not many people get to see them. And then they were put in a crate for another 100 years and then they were taken out again to be looked at. So it's kind of this neat little puzzle and mystery um, that I think is really, really interesting and kind of keeps me going. So our next question is, uh, you mentioned that you teach human anatomy when you're not researching fishes. That is an interesting combination. Can you share how these two subjects complement each other and how did you get to these areas of expertise? So I got very good advice when I was a graduate student um, by my advisor who said, jobs in paleoic theology are very few you're going to learn how to go teach human anatomy so you can get a job. Uh, so when I was a graduate student, I taught gross anatomy as um, the kind of person in the lab, and it was great on-the-job training. And it is true that a lot of paleontologists have their teaching involved in anatomy as well. It ended up, I loved teaching gross anatomy. I mean, it's looking at structure and looking for differences, it's kind of similar to what you do with fossils. Uh, it's just that when you're doing human anatomy, it's bigger. So it might be a little bit easier than working with uh, fishes. So it was a really good combination. And it was something that I um, was very fortunate that when I was defending my dissertation, I had lined up interviews for a job teaching anatomy. Our next question is, do you work with specimens from particular localities or focus on existing museum specimens? So a little bit of both. I have primarily focused on specimens that are coming from North America. And it is, I've used, I used to do some field work at specific localities but I have been working more on museum specimens. And what is nice is because there is so much work to do, you can go to a museum and find absolutely beautiful, fantastic specimens that are just kind of waiting to be worked on. And so I've gone to museums looking specifically for Carboniferous fishes, maybe kind of leaning towards those collected in North America and um, I have not had any problems finding things that need to be worked on. So I would say I focus on Carboniferous. I have a tendency to be working on fishes from North America. And right now I am kind of working on what is already in museums. In the past, I was uh, doing field work. We have another question uh, kind of related, so I'm going to skip over Howard's question and come back to it afterwards, because Liam asked, is there a particular place or museum where they have a lot of these fish on display? So many. There's some in the Wagner. Um, there's definitely some on display in the Wagner. Um, Carnegie has an amazing collection of Carboniferous fishes. Um, I've gone to the uh, Canadian Museum of Nature, excellent. Cleveland Museum, excellent. Like the list goes on and on. Uh, Chicago, the there's kind of the there's no limit on where you could go to find these 
these fishes in museums. All right, and coming back to the last question, has a phylogenetic analysis by artificial intelligence been done or been considered inputting multiple characteristics or visuals of each fossil sample and having the AI program work out potential relationships? Oh, so I have not thought about that. Um, I have to admit that I don't know too much about AI. I can tell you that it might be something that you would have to kind of give the characters, we call them characters in phylogenetic analysis, and then character states. So a character would be like presence of a preoperculum, and then the character state would be present or absent. So I'm, I'm going to have to say, I don't understand too much about AI, but it might be something that a researcher needs to come up with those characters and character states. And then maybe AI could be scanning the fossils to be looking for those things. I'm not, I'm not actually very sure. That's a, that's a really intriguing question. Definitely. And our next question is, how do paleonisquids fit, uh, if at all, on the lineage from ray-finned fish to tetrapod limbs, or are they a separate branch? So I think you have picked up on why actinopterygian fishes are maybe understudied. They're on a separate branch, and so they are not involved in the transition to land and the tetrapod limb. So the two kind of groupings of bony fishes are actinopterygians and sarcopterygians. Sarcopterygian fishes are going to be the um, branch leading to tetrapod limbs. And I have a sneaky suspicion that's why actinopterygians don't get as much attention because they are on a separate branch. Our next question from Dennis is, I see a lot of dermal bones on the displayed specimens. Do you have a sense how phylogenetically useful are these features for reconstructing phyl phylogenies compared to endoskeletal elements? In my opinion, both should be there. So um, you have dermal bones and that is everything that I showed you pictures of was showing you dermal bones. There would be um, the uh, endoskeletal elements that are super important. Sadly, they don't preserve as often as those dermal bones. So you have some very few but amazing and important specimens that will show some of the endoskeleton. We have some specimens that you have fossilized brain cases, and those are incredibly important. But then you get into this dilemma of um, there are not that many. And you might get those endoskeletal elements preserved, but not the dermal elements. So you don't know who they came from in comparison to all of the other specimens. So in my opinion, and a lot of other researchers' opinions, when you do a phylogenetic analysis, you need the dermal elements and you also need those endoskeletal elements or the endocranial elements. And when you have some of that data missing, you just code it honestly as being missing. And um, there have been studies that show, even if you have a lot of incomplete data where you put a lot of question marks in the analysis, it's still important to put those taxa in because of the information that it shares. So I would say, you should have a phylogeny with both. What can be inferred about the environment at the time of paleonisquoids and or about the cause of their extinction? Modern deep sea studies occasionally uncover new or exotic species. Any hope of finding a living paleonisquoid one day? I would love to find a living paleonisquoid. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, the closest that I have, I keep a lot of fish for pets. The closest I would have would be that biker, the polypterus, um, that would be kind of the oldest living actinopterygian, but still very distant related from paleonisquoids. 
For the inference about their environment, there's been a lot of studies kind of comparing fishes today and where they're living and looking kind of at the body shape. So um, on that one slide where I had like an illustration showing all of the different Carboniferous fish, there were some like disc shaped fish that would be deep bodied. We have deep bodied fishes today. And so there's comparisons over maybe that morphotype or that body type was living in a similar environment. Uh, same thing for those kind of like eel shaped fishes. So there's been a lot of work with that. And then there's been a lot of work looking at the dentition of the fishes and comparing them to the teeth of fish today to kind of infer what they ate. Um, but what the best thing for inferring the kind of paleo environment would be is a situation where you have a fossil Lagerstatten, which is a really fancy way of saying a mother load. These are going to be localities where you have incredible preservation and you have beautifully preserved animals but you also may have plants, you may have um, pollen spores, you may have trackways. And so you can put together all of this information and not only understand the, the animals living in the environment, but kind of reconstruct the environment too. So the best way to reconstruct the environment would be through the um, fossil Lagerstatten. One of the bad things about, or kind of, um, unfortunate things is whenever you're dealing with fossils, you're dealing with, you need those animals to have preserved. So the situation needs to be just right for preservation. So then that might mean that we're not capturing everything in terms of the fauna and where they were living, because it might not have been um, just right for the, the um, fishes to be preserved. So we might miss something about certain environments. All right, we have one final question in the chat right now, which is how can we be certain that two fossils are different species or variations within one species? Your careful descriptive work. And it can always be overturned. So um, science is always, in my opinion, um, you are working towards putting together the strongest case for something. And as we learn new things, you may have to go back and reassess your previous conclusions. And that's okay. But if you have to reassess previous conclusions, that is evidence that science is working because it's always a process. I actually oh. Have, oh, sorry, go ahead. There is a question about um, what was the fish that I mentioned that is the closest? Polypterus. Um, it's called a biker. So biker is in the chat. And then I'll put in the genus name is polypterus. They are fishes only found in Africa. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I actually have a question, which is if you could talk a little bit about what makes something a holotype um, exactly and what kind of features it needs to have to fit that description. So the holotype should be your absolute best specimen, the one that when you sit down to it, you can see all of the things that you are saying are important for recognizing that taxon. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have something in the description that isn't preserved in the holotype. Like I have holotypes that don't have certain fins, but um, you can then in your description reference other specimens, give the specimen number in your description saying the description of the dorsal fin is from specimen blah, blah, blah. So that there is a written record of while it's not preserved in the holotype, all of those features in the holotype are also in this specimen. And then now we can talk about the dorsal fin based on, on this other specimen. So the holotype should be something that 
is your reference point that is going to preserve the majority of the features you are saying are important for identifying that specific taxon. Thank you. All right, do we have any more questions? I'm checking the chat right now. Oh, it looks like we have one more. We have a few minutes. Yeah. So Dennis asked, any sense whether paleoniscoid specimens are more likely to be found in marine or freshwater localities? This is a very controversial question. Um, there probably a lot of the evidence points to they were marine, at least very early on. They were all probably marine or um, kind of near shore environments where maybe there was some influx of fresh water, but it would be like marine or brackish. So it gets kind of controversial because there are some sites that you have these fishes and then some indicators of other fossil specimens that would point to it being uh, marine but you have maybe amphibians and all of the amphibians today are freshwater. So then if you kind of apply that, you can kind of take it and there are some people that will make some environments freshwater because the amphibians are there, even though there's a lot of data that may say the other, that it was marine. So that is a very controversial question. Um, my sense is a lot of the kind of Devonian and Carboniferous environments were marine and that these fish started marine and then you would have maybe a kind of movement towards some freshwater environments. Um, oh, I just got a question and do you want to try to answer one in sure. <laughs> two minutes? Okay. Uh, so a microscopic view of the fossil scales to pick out parasitic organisms. Maybe if the parasites were really large, there are actually people who specialize in pathologies, not so much like the small parasites, but you can actually see where a animal may have had an injury that healed may have had signs of disease that healed. So there's an entire field of um, paleontology that is paleopathology. And so if it's preserved, it can be studied. So it might not be super small parasites that could be studied, but maybe large enough that it would preserve and be viewed under a microscope. All right, and we're at 6.59, so we'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming to uh, tonight's talk and make sure that you don't miss the next one. It'll be on January 9th, 2023, hosted by the Mütter. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mickle, for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was very fun. Thanks. Hey guys.